Hi, I'm Bill Carmody, and I'm the Marketing Whisperer. And today, I am thrilled to have Bobby Rebel here with me on the program today. Hi, Bobby. Hello. How are you? How are you? I am awesome. And Bobby just finished writing this book. She's going to be publishing next week. It is one of the most awesome places to start about financial literacy. If you are looking to hear all the great stories from all these amazing people about being a financial grown up. So let me just give a little quick background about Bobby so you know who we're talking to. Bobby is actually an award winning television anchor and personal finance columnist from Thomson Reuters, it is the largest news organization in the world. Her business videos are seen on hundreds of broadcasts and online channels around the world, and a Reuters column is per on personal finance is syndicated to hundreds of newspapers and websites worldwide. She was formerly a reporter at PBS for Nightly Business Report and held various producer positions at CNN and CNBC. She's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and has a certificate of, in financial planning from New York University. Wow. wow thank you, Bill. <laughs> that was great. So let's start off with just how you have about 30 amazing superstars uh, that you were able to pull in and have them talk specifically and candidly about their financial grown up moment. So talk to me a little bit about how you sort of pulled them in and sort of how you decided on the people that you wanted to interview and, and just put this book together. Well, it's interesting, Bill, because it was really kind of a messy process and I love the way it came out. Um, I had this idea that I wanted to present something unique to my readers that they hadn't, that they couldn't search for on the internet. That was something we've never heard before. And I wanted to get really important people to talk personally about their money. So I came up with these two questions. What was your financial growth moment and what is your lesson to share? And I started approaching people and I didn't know what I would get. I thought maybe I would just get everyone saying, well, I ran up a big credit card debt in college and I worked really hard to pay it off and I really learned my lesson and you shouldn't have credit card debt too. And only one person, Heather Thompson from the Real Housewives of New York City, um, who also was a fantastic entrepreneur, um, she did have a similar story to that. But the rest was a wide range of things that I had never possibly imagined. And in fact, the original mm -hmm. idea for the book, and I don't know that I've told people this, was to have 10 chapters and just have a lead off from the role models for each of the 10 chapters. But when they started coming in so diverse and so dramatic, I changed the whole format of the book to weave them throughout as a storyline. And I love the way it came out. I, I do too. I mean, I think one of the things about that, that you basically have seen every aspect of finance show up in your book. And again, I love that it wasn't planned that way. I love the fact that you sort of said, hey, let's see what people have to share and then let's organize it because it's very clear when you look at each chapter that there are very specific organizing principles that these masters all came back with and it's really fantastic. Exactly, what happened was I basically had a puzzle. I started getting all yeah. of these different stories and I started writing around the stories. So for example, I had not originally planned to do a health and wellness chapter. Actually, we ended, we ended up calling it Wealth and Wellness, but we got this dramatic <laughs> story from Alexia Bure of, well, of um, well Plus Good, and we had to do it. And from that came so many incredible stories about your health and how that impacts your career, your ability to work, your ability to focus. We talk about everything from meditation to health to putting your image together. And that was really important. I also ended up having a chapter on friends and finances, which can get very dicey, especially for entrepreneurs, because you have to figure out yes. how do you mix your friends and your business, because they are inextricably linked no matter what you do. There's no way to separate it these days. Your friends are people you do business with. Your business colleagues are your friends. So you have to manage those relationships and those businesses very carefully. So I definitely want to get, that's the CEO of Huge, I think you're starting yes. to get into. Before Aaron, before Aaron we jump Chris. into that one, let's start at the very beginning because your forward is by none other than Tony Robbins himself. So how did that happen? That's awesome. Well, Tony is somebody, somebody that I've interviewed for Reuters and you've interviewed Tony as well. And I've always been a huge fan. And he really, for the, by the way, inspired my motivation to do this book. People say, how did you even do this? You have children, you have a full-time job and so on. Well, I heard Tony's voice. I listened to audiobooks all the time and I would hear Tony's voice saying, you just have to decide. So I decided. Yes. And as it happens, awesome. through my normal routines at Reuters, I did have chances to interview Tony. And one time I said to him, Tony, I've got this project going on. It's going to be amazing. I had a few people in the book of note already. And he really just stopped me there and said, what do you need, Bobby? How can I help? Which you I know, because you know Tony. Yes. You, it, that's Tony. Yes. He just said, what can I do It is. To help? It totally is. And he was a big fan of the book, and he ended up writing the foreword. So I feel truly blessed and honored to have him associated with the book. 
That's awesome. Well, and 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 more power to you. It's it's, it's an awesome it's an awesome contribution, not just the forward, but also his own view yeah. in terms of personal finance and what it means. So let's because we're really focusing on entrepreneurs today. I do want to get right into the CEO of Huge. I think that was a really fantastic uh, section of your book, talking about sort of entrepreneurs and sort of how they figure out how to work with their business partners and sort of what that looks like. So let's d dive into that a little bit deeper. Well, yes, Aaron Shapiro is the CEO of Huge, and he told a really inspiring story and a tough story and a very personal story about how he dealt with one of his earlier companies before huge because he had hired many of his friends and he looked at his cash flow situation and he looked at where the business was going and he knew he had to make some tough decisions and it's one thing to have cutbacks when they're employees but when your employees are your friends as is often the case with startup businesses you're making a very tough and a very personal decision and he made that decision and he talks about what went into it how difficult it was, and that it was the right decision in the end. And I think his current success is evidence of, of his ability to make those tough decisions, but also to be sensitive to the fact that these are his friends and that he thought very carefully about it and only made the decision, made the decision when it had to be made. You know, it's it's fascinating because essentially when you when you go into the, your book, every single time you ask people about their sort of financial grown up moment, you know, something different comes up for these individuals. And and what's interesting is is that you can either start very early on in life, or you can start like somewhere in your career, or even when you start to realize, oh my God, I'm not in a position to retire. You know, anywhere along that spectrum, you can have a grown up moment. Yeah. But I think what's great about your book is by sharing those grown up moments, you sort of say, hey, where are you in the spectrum? You know, are you in a position where you're just starting out? in the world, in which case, just I love your chapter on basically, do you even need to buy a car? Yes. You know, it's a fantastic question, yes. you know, because you know, when I was a kid, there was no option. The only thing you could do, you couldn't even lease, you know, basically you had to buy and the best thing you could do is buy used. But now you make a very compelling point that between Uber and Lyft and all these other services, do you actually need a car or is it just a status symbol for you? Because it will affect your personal finance depending on the choices you make. So I love Thank that. Thank you so much. Yeah, it is interesting. I have two stepchildren that are teenagers, I can't get either of them to even take driving lessons. Now, granted, we are in New York City, so let's be fair. We're, if we were in the suburbs, it might be might be different. But the status symbol of a car is very different these days because we have so much social media and so many other ways to connect to people. Traditionally, as teenagers, if you wanted freedom, you wanted that car. And, and it really reflected yeah. your uh, individuality and your adulthood in many ways. And many of the role models, it's interesting, who are generally older, uh, talk about the fact that they had cars that they really loved or cars that they coveted. Elliot Weisbluth talks about a car that he really wanted, but he decided not <laughs> to buy the car because it wasn't the right financial decision. Uh, Bob Moritz right. from PwC talks about the fact that he sold his beautiful car that he loved so much because he wanted to achieve a different financial goal. And Terry Lundgren even talks about, and that's the CEO of Macy's, talks about the fact that he thought about a car he wanted to buy when making a major life decision. So cars play a big role in our lives, but for younger people, less so. There's a lot more focus on other things that give them status and freedom, the way cars used to. Uh, so we, we flip around a lot of these things. The other thing that I think is interesting about younger people these days is that when Gen Xers lived at home, that was kind of a slacker thing. That was, well, you're not really yes. functioning as an adult. You're living at home with mom and dad. That's not cool here, just the opposite now. Now you're living at home with your parents, you're paying down student debt, you're building a base, you're going to build up enough money to have a down payment for a home. Wow. How financially responsible are you? You're living at home. Great job. So yes, change. exactly. <laughs> Well, and I think I think that's what the, the the common theme throughout the entire book, which I love, is that financial responsibility. The idea that I think where most people get uh, tripped up in finance is they don't want to deal with it, right? So the idea is I want to have the magic credit card in college that I can just pay for stuff and not you not have to actually pay for it, right? Until until you rack up exactly. the debt and you're like, oh my god, I'm going to be in this debt exactly. forever, you know? And then and then you and then a lot of people they'll get married and they'll be like, oh thank God I'm married now because now I can be let careful. my spouse take care of my finances. Exactly. And, and, you know, and the same thing in business. You know, it's like, well, you know what? I'm going to hire a really, really smart finance, chief financial officer so I never have to think about money ever again. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's like the worst decision well, in your even life. even the smartest right? people, I mean, Mark Cuban, who is not in the book but hope to have him in the future, he talks about the fact yes. that he had a real run-in with somebody who took money from him early in, early in his career. It's happened to so many people, Billy Joel, so many people that have had huge success, but yet they surrounded themselves with people that took advantage of them. And, and you really have to always be on your game and paying attention.
Sally Krawcheck, who is a role model in the book. That's a wonderful story that she shared. I couldn't believe it when I saw it because it is such a raw and real story. But her husband uh, was not candid with her about their money. She didn't know what was going on in her marriage in many, many ways, but including money. Mm -hmm. And obviously, um, that's a yes. little bit of a teaser for your for your viewers. But um, <laughs> Sally Krawcheck told a very revealing story. I will tell you I will tell you that what's interesting for me is that I don't think there is such a thing as a single, you know, incident of a financial grown-up moment. I think we have multiple grown-up moments throughout our entire lives. And I think what's great about the book is that it basically hits those different areas. So, I mean, I'll, I I very distinctly remember when I was 12 years old, my uncle sort of inviting all of us out to uh to dinner. And I grew up on the lower end of middle class, and so we were always we didn't go out to dinner very often. It was very rare, it was a big treat. And I remember thinking as a kid oh my god there's like 15 adults here and they're having everything you know the steak and you know just high-end high-end foods that i typically wasn't exposed to and i just remember thinking to myself how are we going to pay for you this were thinking right that and at that age, moment that's really interesting well that's, so, that's so your moment it was, that's your grown-up moment or at least the first one you remember it, it was it was. It, it was my very first grown-up moment because my at the time I'm thinking about this, my uncle pulls out his credit card, doesn't even look at the bill, hands it to the waiter, and I thought, oh my God, that's amazing. And I thought, you know, here's someone who has enough of sort of financial success in their lives where they can treat the entire family, not just his own immediate family, but everybody, to this wonderful dinner and not be stressed out about the bill. And I thought, you know what, that's how I want to be. I agree. You know? Well, I agree that he should not be stressed out with the bill, but he should look at the bill. I was kind of oh thinking, yes 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 oh but he should you should always look at the bill always look at the price tag no matter how much money you have because you need to at least be making a proactive decision and by the way even innocently totally. people do make mistakes they're often not in your favor though somehow I'm not sure how that happens it's funny you bring that up I it's funny you bring that up because I actually asked him about that later in life because this has been oh, such wow. a it was such an imprint on me at twelve. Okay. And what he said was, is he said, well, you know what? They always bring you the bill when you have to sign it anyway. And there's always an opportunity. If there is a mistake made, you know, you can always correct it there before you actually sign off on the bill. Okay. I agree. It's better for the waiter you know, or the waitress to do it before I had a time. But it was just such a, a huge moment for me. I was yeah. just like, this is incredible. No, it is. It is. <laughs> so. And it's interesting. I wonder what's going to happen with all of our automated payments on the phones, our mobile payments. Because I know my son, yes. who's nine, the same age as your son, um, pays for when we take a taxi in New York City, which we try not to do too often. But when we do, he, he says, Mom, I got it. And he takes my phone and he puts in the, the digits. But I don't know that he really understands that he's not actually paying for it. He thinks he, right. he, thinks he treats me to taxis all the time. It's great. But we're working on that. We're reading Ron Lieber's <laughs> book. So we're working on it. Harry's got his three jars. So, so I... From the opposite of money. Uh, yes, well, that's good. Spoil, so sorry. that's exactly where I was going to go next. How do you teach your children, right, about money and finance, right? So, so my trick was I I give my kids allowance, and every time I give them, I have three envelopes, right? I have the money that they spend, I have the money that they save, and then the money right. they give. And so every time they get an allowance, they always have money for each one of those envelopes. And the idea there is is that we're teaching them: yes, you have money so you can spend for the toys, but you also have money that you save so that you basically understand the 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 reasons that you have money put aside for when you need it later in life. And then giving and contribution is such a joyful thing that when you give money to others, you feel really good about it yourself. So trying to get that financial literacy Absolutely. early on. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's why, by the way, we are working to raise money for donorschoose.org. Um, I'm working with one of my role models, Elliot Weisbooth of Hightower. Um, and he has co-sponsored a campaign to raise money for Donors Choose, where if people buy the book, it's while supplies last. Um, and basically send a receipt to donors choose at financialgrownup.com. Send us proof of purchase. You can just forward, if you happen to go to Amazon, you can just forward it, but you can certainly buy the book anywhere. And we'll send you a gift code uh, for $18, which is about the selling price of the book right now on Amazon. And you can go and support a teacher's project at donors choose. So I really That's encourage great. all of your readers to do that and help us support them so that they can teach students because it's just not happening right now. Um, we're not teaching financial yeah. literacy in school. I believe only 17 states um, require that high schoolers take a personal finance class, which is just not enough. And the majority of teachers don't even feel qualified to be teaching personal finance. So 
we really need to be focused on this a little bit more and get people educated at an earlier age because from that education will come a lot more career success. We'll get more entrepreneurs. If people feel comfortable yes. with their own money and with learning how to calculate their own business expenses, you know, revenue is great, but it's really important to understand that's not everything. you got to know the bottom line. You have to really have a handle on your expenses and the basic um, top and bottom line of running a business. That can start very early. That can start very early. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that you actually mentioned in a previous conversation you and I had was about during the debates, there's been very little conversation about, well, education overall, but then specifically financial right. education and understanding how important that is throughout your life. Yeah, you I mean, I, I haven't bit? heard any mention of it. I was complimenting yeah. to you, Soledad <laughs> O'Brien, another journalist who, to her credit, did, did tweet that we aren't hearing anything about education. And I think she was spot on. We do need to be talking about education yeah. overall, and we specifically need to be teaching financial literacy. It's just not going on. As I mentioned, only 17 states are requiring it, and we're not in a, we're not understanding that this is a state of crisis because if we don't teach our children the basics of finance, how to manage their own money, they will all be spiraling downward as they move into adulthood. And that goes to the heart of everything. Absolutely, we need to focus on creating jobs. But if you teach people about money and you teach people about their own finances, they're going to be motivated to create their own jobs, to be entrepreneurs, to start businesses, yes. to understand our tax code, whatever it is, because it will, con it will continue to change. And of course, to give back to the community. So we need to get in there, get to these children young. And again, I'm going to plug my donors choose campaign. Donate to Donors Choose anyone, and absolutely to my campaign, which is DonorsChoose.org forward slash financial grown up. But anywhere on Donors Choose, there's wonderful projects that teachers want to teach children about various topics, whatever you want to support. In my case, financial literacy. And I do really encourage your viewers to do that. I love it. And I think one of the things that's interesting in terms of education is it, there's no there's no money classes no. that you take even in, in junior high, high school, or even college. You know, we talk about finance. It's in the context of accounting and how do you actually put things in particular buckets. But the real fundamentals that you're, that you're talking about and advocating for is basically how do you manage your own personal finance? How do you basically do beyond just balancing a checkbook, a checkbook how do you actually look at ways in which to save? How do you know sort of how to stay out of credit card debt? What are the sort of pitfalls that every business goes through when they're thinking about things in terms of money, right? I mean, I, one of my favorite guys, uh, Keith Cunningham, talks about the fact that, you know, profit is an illusion and cash or is a theory. Profit is a theory and cash is a fact, right? Because basically businesses don't go out of, out of business because they uh, don't have profits. They go out of business because they have no cash, you know? So, so managing your money is critical. My, one of my friend's sisters, and she allowed me to quote her directly, Sherry Schneider, she ran a business um, that was very successful, the Divine Bars. It was, I believe, in the late 90s. And then she went into the food business. She knew what she was doing, and yet she didn't have enough capital backstop to deal with all the red tape that was going on in New York City. So by the time she launched this mm -hmm. restaurant, which was absolutely adorable, it was such a fun restaurant. It was great. She did a wonderful job. But she, by that point, because she'd burned through so much of her cash pile just to get to opening day, she had such a short lead that she couldn't keep it going long enough to really launch the business. And it was so sad because so much had gone into it. You really need to make sure you're well capitalized when you start a business. And that is something that I think many entrepreneurs don't pay enough attention to. Just like it goes to anything. Do a home yeah. renovation. Double so the number. True. Maybe you won't spend it, but you might. And you want to have that money because you don't want to be in the yeah. middle of construction. It goes to everything in life, whether you're an entrepreneur or just running your own family finances. Because every family needs to have their own CFO as well. Well, and one of the other people that you had a, a pleasure of speaking with and connecting with was yes. Martin Sorrell from Sir WPP. Sir so tell me, yes, yes. So, so tell me about this in terms of sort of you connected with him, looking at his money and sort of looking at it from a financial perspective, what were some of the key insights you took well, away from that Well, it's interesting because you get, one of the things that I love about this book is that you get different points of view. So what Sir Martin really stresses mm -hmm. is that you spend so much time at work that you need to do something that you're passionate about and your work is your passion and they should be one and the same. So he really stressed that. Mm -hmm. That is to some degree in opposition to what Kevin O'Leary said, which is he wanted, well, I'm not going to say he had a, a hobby that he actually is incredibly talented at. He wanted to pursue that as a full-time job. His stepfather, who was very influential on him, said, no, 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 you need to earn money. And he agreed. Kevin always wanted to earn money. Don't get me wrong. Right. So he went in to the education software business and earned some money. Now he still does the hobby. Of course, he gives all his money to charity from that. But he felt that you can go earn money in order to pursue your passion. Sir Martin said, money and pa make it work together. 
so what I love about this book is there's different things and everyone can take from it what they want because these are different lives, different stories, and they're all complimentary, but they're all individual. That's awesome. Bobby Rebel, How to Be a Financial Grown-Up is a fantastic book. It's great for your own business, but it's also great for your family and helping make sure that even your kids understand the value and the power of money. So, Bobby, thank you so much for being on the program today. I really appreciate it.